Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this introduction to vertical coordinate reference systems. I am Javier Jimenez Shaw, I'm a cross contributor, civil engineer, and software developer. And you can find more info about my life on the GitHub profile, and there you can go to my webpage and other places. So, what are we going to see today? First, a bit of history to get some context. Then I will try to answer why do we need a vertical reference, and we see why or how water flows down. We'll see the equipotential surface, that's an important concept, what's a mean sea level, and why we take it as a reference. What's vertical coordinate reference system itself, and we'll talk about GNSS and GOE models. <coughs> so at the beginning there was an explosion, then came the dinosaurs, <coughs> and later came the Romans. <laughs> and this is a picture of the Aqua Claudia aqueduct near Rome. It is about 69 kilometers long aqueduct. It's one of the aqueducts of Rome, it had many. It was uh, done in the first century and it has an average slope of 0.16%. To get an idea, the slope of a road to push the, the rainwater to the sides is 2%. That's 12 times bigger than that. And the reason is that otherwise the energy of the water can either erode the surface of the aqueduct and destroy the, the infrastructure because it has a lot of energy. And how they did it. So we have written description of this device that's called uh, Corobate, I think I pronounced properly in English. And it was uh, similar, the idea of a modern level, and they use that to get some horizontal plane. We have only the description, uh, written description, there is no painting or no actual device, so this kind of uh, interpretation. There is uh, this interesting PDF in English on this webpage that is planning a lot of things about Roman construction written by a, a civil engineer. Okay. After this brief uh, history, <laughs> why do we need a vertical reference? So easy answer, to measure heights. And with heights we can later compute slopes. And we know that water flows downwards and pretty fast. And what's up and down? Yeah, so the gravity defines the direction of up and down. And the gravity shapes the earth, at the end gravity rules. And spoiler alert, gravity is not constant, neither in magnitude nor in direction. Yeah, you can see this funny YouTube video about up and down in Sesame Street. <coughs> okay, the water flows downwards and at some point stops because it still reaches an equilibrium and thus it forms an isopotential or key potential surface, that's synonyms. And points on that surface, they have the same gravitational potential. So there's no work to move there. So skating on a frozen lake, it's very easy because you don't have to go against gravity, only against uh, friction. So water flows downwards, and then at the end reaches the end, the sea, sorry. And we know that the sea is flat, but we know that the sea is not flat. <laughs> it's yeah, more or less in a sphere. We'll see later what's the shape of the, of the, she, of the sea in the Earth. And now I have to explain a bit more about this equipotential surface and a plumb line. So probably you have seen a plumb line or a construction site or rehabilitation of, of doing something on a building. It's this uh, string with something heavy at the end. Plumb is uh, lead in Latin, by the way, lot in German is also lead. It's something heavy going, pointing down. But gravity is not constant. So if you connect all the points of that point, the uh, plumb line, you get a line that's not a straight line. So you can see in the image on the right hand side, many things. I love this picture because there's a lot of things there. First is that the water on the sea is fitting an equipotential surface. Those dotted lines are equipotential surfaces. There's an inner lake on the right that's also in an equipotential surface but higher. The plumb line that 
goes, that goes through the point P is not a straight line because the gravity is not constant. There is a big mass there, that's the mountain, that distorts gravity because of big masses like mountains or uh, density. The, the crust of the Earth is not ha is, does have the same density. So, yeah, ch ch things change. And also, the distance between these dotted lines, the distance between the equipotential surfaces is not constant. You see how there, uh, does it work? No. Okay. How can I put it? Control L. Control L. Yeah. Um, the distance between the lines is not constant all the time. Well, we see logic that uh, one of those equipotential surfaces is a good reference, and yeah, C sounds a good idea. But the C is moving up and down because of the tides, because of the atmospheric events. Okay, we compute a mean C level that seems to be a good zero. It's also Good idea because there are not many places under the sea level, so probably all the highs that we're going to use are positive. Not always, but mainly. Computing this mean is not always obvious. <coughs> you need a long time. The example I have there, it's uh, the zero reference in Spain, that's in Alicante in the Mediterranean Sea, and they were measuring during two years between 1870 and 72, the measure and the harbor, and they defined the zero. And each country were doing something similar. So each country has their own reference. So we have one point, and next to the sea, that's a CO for the vertical measurements. But we have to move that inland. So we want to measure elevations inland. And how we do it with that device and a lot of work. This is called a level <coughs> that you have to level it, make it perfectly horizontal, and then you make uh, like horizontal lines between these level roads, the, those roads there. <coughs> and then <coughs> you can compute the point on the road and you see how high is the next point. For the high accuracy network in Spain, the maximum distance between these roads is 50 meters. So you could imagine how much work you have to do point after point after point to cover your entire country. There's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. <laughs> and you create a lot of dots, a lot of points. You get a measurement. And this is an example from Buenos Aires in Argentina. And the first network is the purple one. That's called the high precision, alta precision. And they start in Buenos Aires doing all those points. They close the loop to compensate some errors that you may take during the, the measurement, and you are making a network. And after that, you can make another network, the green one, that's just precision, not high precision, and you get more points, and then you get another one, that's the uh, orange one, and you get more points. And if you need your elevation at your construction site or your point of interest, you do something similar. So you look for uh, one of those reference points near you, and then you transfer that elevation to your point. This network is detached from the triangulation network for the latitude-longitude network. You don't really need to know exactly the, the latitude and longitude of those elevation markers. <coughs> and that was the case, by the way. <laughs> and this is an example <coughs> of a um, survey elevation marker and a funny joke from SKCD. I don't know how many thousands of no, yeah, a lot of them in the US, and they have a problem to control them all. Sometimes they are destroyed, or they don't find it, or <coughs> they move it. And I say a few slides ago <coughs> that every country were defining their own reference, their own mean sea level. Spain was taking the reference in uh, Alicante, the US was taking the reference in Canada, by the way, in Quebec area. <laughs> yeah. And that means that the same point may have different elevations depending on which country you are using to get that elevation. For instance, this uh, point in Baselberg is the common point for Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. <clears throat> and for Germany and the Netherlands, the elevation of this point is 322 meters. 
but for Bellium it's 324, more than two meters difference. And it's an easy point, it's not a peak in the middle of the Alps, it's a really easy place to get there. And they have different elevations depending on where you're measuring. So when you are telling an elevation, it's important to say which vertical reference you're using, because maybe the elevation is different. And we don't need much more to define a vertical coordinate reference system. These are two examples in the PSG. <coughs> the one on the left is the Spanish one that I explained before. The one on the right is the Estonian one that they told me yesterday that was added recently. You don't need so much. You just have to define, okay, I have a reference, I have a name, there's a vertical datum, that's, but you don't need uh, so much to define that. But please do it. If your, comp if your country doesn't register the vertical reference system in EPSG, do it. I will ask that again later. And let me review a bit how we get here and what's happening then. So already in the first century before Christ, Petruvius was describing this Corobates device and they were building aqueducts. In the 17th century, Newton was talking about gravity. In the 19th century, we have the first vertical datums and these are two examples of a uh, vertical coordinate reference system in the US, the one in the 20s, NGVD 29, in the 80s, NAVD 88. But there was a big uh, new thing happening in the 2000s that the GPS was done available for civil use without error. Before that, you could use that, but there was some added error by the army because GPS is for the army, but they removed that. And that was really helpful. And now there are many new datums being created now, like the US are now releasing one next year. <coughs> so let me explain a bit how the GNSS, the Global Navigation Satellite Systems work, and how we are going to use to measure heights. GPS is one of the different implementations. So the satellite there knows its own coordinates in a geocentric system. Geocentric is a center in the Earth, a Cartesian system, X, Y, Z, and it's attached to, to the Earth, it's rotating with the Earth. So the satellites, they are very smart and they know their exact location at any point and they are sending that information uh, via radio wave. And we, on the surface of the Earth, we, using the information from several satellites, we compute the location where we are in the same geocentric system, in this X, Y, Z. But we are used to use latitude and longitude coordinates. So having a coordinate in X, Y, Z, geocentric, it's kind of a strange. Doesn't give too much information to me, just looking at those numbers. Looking at uh, latitude and longitude, it's, for me, it's much more easy. So we can do this transformation, but we need a third dimension, that's the elevation, the ellipsoidal height. Why? Because these latitude and longitude are on an ellipsoid, and we measure the height above this ellipsoid. <coughs> and I was talking before about the equipotential surface. It has a name. It's called the geoid. And this image there is an acceleration of the geoid respect to the ellipsoid. You don't notice that at all because the difference between the geoid and the ellipsoid is between 100 and 80. I mean, negative 100 and positive 80 meters, so not that much. Definitely you don't notice on a, on a globe. <coughs> and it is kind of the mean sea level, also where the other continents, it's not only where there is sea, but also here, uh, taking only uh, the influence of gravity and rotation of the Earth. So you ignore the tides from the sun and the moon or other planets and other stuff. And it's an irregular surface. It's not the topographic surface of anything. Heights. There are different type of heights. I mentioned, oh, I forgot to mention that, when this picture of the equipotential surfaces on the plumb line, orthometry heights are measured along this plumb line, plumb line. So it's like exactly going downwards because the plumb line describes going downwards. So there are different type of heights, gravity-related heights, like the orthometry height, the normal height, the dynamic heights. There's an article there, interesting, 
I'm not going to get into that, but what about ellipsoid height? Right? Ellipsoid height is not a gravity-related height. And I will try to explain here how it works. So first, the satellites, they know their own x, y, z coordinate in this geocentric system. <clears throat> and doing some black magic, we compute the coordinates of the device on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth. That's the second line, in, also in geocentric coordinates. We do some easy math to convert those geocentric to geographic, latitude, longitude, and ellipsoidal height. That's much easier than the first one. <laughs> but we don't want ellipsoidal height. We want orthometric height. And there we apply the GOE model. And everybody is asking, where is the GOE model? I want to use the GOE model. But see that these first three lines are happening only in the 21st century when we had satellites. Now we can do it because we have GNSS. But before, we were getting directly the orthometry heights from those marks on the, on the field that were done by the local agencies with a lot of work. So the GOI model is converting from this latitude longitude ellipsoidal height to latitude longitude orthometry height where you take in consideration exactly, exactly where is the sea level. And this is a formula used to measure that. <coughs> it's just a subtraction or addition, depends on the order. You have the orthometry height, the ellipsoid height, and geoid height or geoid undulation. They are not perfectly aligned. There's a small angle there, this deflection of the vertical. The highest I've seen is like one minute of arc. It's very small, so you can do a lot of simplifications on this uh, addition there. The geoid height can be positive and negative. Here, it's about 20 meters positive in Estonia. In Berlin, it is around 40 meters. In Madrid, it is 50 meters. Uh, in the US, in the continental US, it's negative value. I think in Florida, it was negative 20. And a geoid model, it's a grid, because you have to measure points. The gravity is different, so you cannot just use a simple formula. And it's stored as a grid, like a geotiff. That's what we use in Proch. <coughs> that means that there is some interpolation. So when you are computing your orthometry height based on the ellipsoidal height, there is some interpolation. You have to interpolate on a geographic CRS. And your phone probably has one. Well, for sure, if it's giving you elevation above mean sea level. But because you need that to get orthometry heights from measurements from a satellite. But the OI model is just an implementation detail. What's important to identify the heights is the vertical coordinate reference system. And here are some examples. On the right-hand side are the vertical coordinate reference systems. The first is in Estonia, Spain, the US, UK, and Japan. And there are the OI models that they use. The US, for instance, has different versions because they are updating their model with better implementations. And what I'm going to show now is not a topographic map, even if it looks like a topographic map, OK? <laughs> it is EGM 2008. That's a GOE model for the whole planet. And the contour lines are every two meters. So this is not the surface of the Earth. It, this is representing the GOE model as with contour lines. And you see how it's very uh, clear, some tectonic locations like the west coast of uh, South America and Japan. Does PROCH uh, support vertical reference systems? Yes, of course. This is an example of a common line that's converting from ellipsoidal to compound with uh, orthometry heights in Spain. But not everybody is, not every country is publishing the GOI model. This map there, it's the GOI models that are included in PROCH data. If your country has a GOI model and it's not here, yeah, talk with your agency or talk with us and we can do the best to include it. And yes, agency has some questions for them, some requests, not questions. Please add your vertical coordinate reference systems to EPSG. Because maybe you have just one and it is the vertical reference system for you because you live in your country, but software and users it's good to identify that with a unique identifier, with a number, with a name, <coughs> and it makes things much easier for software. If you have different systems for different islands, like happened in Spain, every island has their own system. Was a, 
bit uh, work to do that, but it's doable. If you have the GOE model, register them in the EPSC. You have only to name it. You don't have to provide the file. And please, if you have your models, uh, release them with open license, and then we will be able to include them in Proj. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Javier. So, any questions? So, why don't some countries release their GOA models? What do they do? They view it as security? Is it uh, what, are, what are the reasons? Yeah, I've seen different reasons. One is security, and for instance, in Lithuania, now with the, the war, they say no, we are not publishing any geographic data. Other is copyright. It's published. The GOE model is usually implemented by somebody at the university, and they have the copyright. Others because they charge, so you can buy it. Like Germany, you had to buy for 500, 700 euros. But now it's public. It's Creative Commons for. But before you had to pay for it because I don't know they want to make make business. Others because laziness. I know countries that they have it, yes, where it is, yeah, okay. They don't register also in EPSC because they are not aware of it, or, but I've seen yeah, several reasons. Yeah, a uh, small question for me. Uh, I'm trying to understand. So you have shown a geoid model, this huge raster, right? So does this mean that Proj now contains several huge rasters for different vertical CRS? Like this? Yes. Well, huge ones. Th this is the whole planet. This EGM 2008. There's another one, uh, much lower resolution, EGM 96, and the rest are per country. How big they are? Like megabytes, gigabytes? This one, if I remember correctly, is about 70 megabytes. Yeah, and this is the biggest one. But also depends on the uh, size of the grid. So this is 2.5. Minute, arc minutes between points. There's another version of this, it's one arc minute, but it's much bigger, so we are not including it. And yeah, depend on the size of the country and the grid size. There's a utility in Prod to fetch these from the uh, PDF, so you don't have to get them all. Yeah. You can get just the one you This yeah. image there is from that cdn.proj.org, but the link there. Yeah. Any other? Uh, my, my question is how much important is the, this information uh, in the field of the historical maps if you need to georeference a uh, historical map? Wow. <laughs> so uh, do I need to you know, calculate the, the historical gravity in that period if I want to correct it? Gravity is not changing that much. Well, it does when there's an earthquake, but many things are changing with an earthquake. So you can go back in time, but the elevation measured back in the 19th century, okay, maybe at the end of 19th century you can rely on that. If you go much backwards, they were not able to measure that elevation properly. But it's not changing that much in time. If you want to go to detail, really to the millimeter, yes, but it was not the case on the historical maps. One last question. Uh, hello, Javier. I have a question because I am Politecnico de Milano. I remember we, I work with some GOID data. Uh, first part of the question would be what format should the GOID data be? Because I remember they had their own format. It's called ISG. I don't know if you're aware of the ISG. And I, I see this map. and. Um, I don't know if you if you know the ISG service. I know they have, for example, the, the geoid of Colombia, but I see it's not there in the approach. So is there a way to, to maybe convert from this database of regional geoids to the approach uh, or, or, a, or a way to input them there? Yeah, well, the easiest way is talking to me <laughs> because that's what I'm doing quite often. I was talking with uh, people from the Colombian agency one month ago, and we want to collaborate to include the Colombian DOE model there. 
they were not aware, they were not aware of the need of being EPSG. They have to publish the GOI model in a proper way with a proper license because Proj is an open source project, but the last many GOI models are published, but with different licenses that we cannot include. And it's a great file. So I have seen a format that's X, Y, Z, like latitude, longitude, and the point, and others are this uh, ISD format that's ASCII -based. Ask, also ASCII-based, but all the points like one after each other, and you have to do the math a bit. Uh, can be uh, a GeoTIFF, that's what we use in Proj. Can be uh, any other format that uses for a grid. GTX is the old standard for the standard kind of standard or use format. Uh, with GTAL, it's easy to convert them. Okay. Thank you, Javier. All the time you have. Thanks.